Welcome and thank you to everyone on call today for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us to discuss the future of sustainability and how we can pave the way towards a greener future. Now, it's a particularly significant day for us to be having this conversation because as many of you know, it's Earth Day. Um, and for those of you who might not know, Earth Day is an annual observance where many of us across the world take some time to remember our responsibility for taking care of the Earth. I remember when I was young, my family and I used to turn off the lights during Earth Day, sit near a candle, play some board games. Um, and we used to just take in, the, take in the idea that we're contributing back or minimizing our impact a little bit. But I'd like to think that since then, we've come a long way. And like many of our indigenous communities here in Canada and beyond, we're changing the way we perceive environmental stewardship to not just an annual event, but rather something that we do and within our daily practices and within our commitments every single day, really changing Earth Day from just one day a year to every day being Earth Day. And that's something that I'm very happy to see. All these individuals, all of you here on the call today are esteemed panelists, and I'm excited to get into the discussion today as well. We'll be talking about some material sustainability topics and answering questions related to what do sustainable strategies look like at the organizational level, the individual level, speaking about climate resilience and adaptation, and even the role of technology and innovation in driving sustainability forward. If you have any questions during this webinar, please don't hesitate them to type them in the chat. Uh, we have an amazing DeGroote team who's helped us to organize the webinar today, so thank you to them. They'll be forwarding onwards to, uh, to myself and the panelists, and we'll try to get do our best to get to them toward the end of the conversation. But before we begin, I do want to say thank you once again to our esteemed panelists who are here today, and I'd like to introduce them as well. So without further ado, let's get right into it. I'd like to introduce Lindsay Hampson, you might know her as the founder of This Rock Inc., an ESG and sustainability consulting firm that was developed back in 2022. You also might know her as a very business-minded tree hugger. Now, This Rock Inc., it's, it's a business that helps other corporations get more sustainable in very simple and profitable ways. Her firm helps very busy people meet new ESG asks from their customers, investors, or bankers. Lindsay herself is a communicator or communications professional turned sustainability expert with an MBA, Fundamental Sustainability Accounting credential from the IFRS Institute, and a 15-year experience career in B2B SaaS sales with IBM, SAP, and Jitterbit. She's also, outside of professional life, a cheerleader to two hockey-playing daughters and one awesome husband, who I'm sure both all think that she's one awesome person as well. And I'd also like to induce our, introduce our second panelist, Mara Berra, who has nearly five years of experience working as a sustainability consultant and project manager in the construction and building industry. For those of you who might not know, the construction sector itself accounts for roughly 40% of global emissions. And with all of us spending so much of our time within these buildings, sustainability is incredibly important from a life cycle perspective, you know, from construction, occupancy, operations, and even the demolition of these buildings. And it's nice to know that MAR works on a variety of projects that includes all of these components of the life cycle. Many, much of her work involves uh, certifications for these types of assets, including LEED, FitWell, and BOMA Best, as well as to new construction projects being designed and constructed to comply with new and emerging mandatory requirements, such as the Toronto Green Standard. I'd like to thank both of you again for taking the time to come out here today and speak to us about sustainability and the way forward. Diving right in, um, I'll start with Lindsay. Lindsay, you work with a variety of clients at your firm, spanning multiple industries from automotive, technology, fintech, manufacturing, and more. And I'd like to think you have a very unique perspective on sustainability, and especially on the current related sustainability concerns for businesses. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're hearing, what the current what the current trend is, what the concerns are and the pain points? For sure. And hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sitting in Hamilton, Ontario, not far from McMaster. I'm in the cotton factory. And um, I'm so glad we're doing this on Earth Day. And thank you, Rithik, uh, for the introduction. Uh, okay, so your question was current sustainability-related concerns from businesses right now. Yes, yeah, so my company exists because these are happening. <laughs> so I guess there's four. Uh, the first is... Businesses are being asked by their biggest customers if they do environmental social governance. It's really happening. Um, I'm seeing it out there. They're being asked if they have certifications or if they have an environmental policy. 
Another one I'm definitely seeing is during the RFP process, so getting a new client, they're being asked, do you track greenhouse gas emissions? Do you have a net zero plan? Or even do you have a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy? So businesses are hearing about this from their largest customers. And of course, that's the way they're profitable is keeping their big customers or attaining new customers. So that first one is the most important one, which is, yeah, they're definitely being asked. So it's impacting the bottom line. The second is banks. So, I mean, think about all the businesses here in Canada. We often rely on banks uh, for, for funding, right? For money. So you can actually get a cut on fees, for example, or even more money if your business can prove it's sustainable. Because think about the banks. They obviously have skin in the game to be more sustainable. There's so much pressure out there. So what did I say? One is customers, two is banks, three is investors. There's so many companies out there that have been in the business for 40 years, 70 years, and um, they want to sell their business. They're looking to the future. And through the M&A process, they're often being asked about sustainability. And then four has got to be the best one. And it's why there's so many people on this call today. And it's people. It's your employees. There's a huge, beautiful generation of people that are starting working or they're the newest managers and they care. They want to work for a place with purpose. So those are the kind of concerns from businesses right now. They need to make sure they're meeting these new demands from all of those four kind of categories while like keeping the plane flying and while being profitable. It's, it's actually, it's, it's pretty intense time for businesses right now. No, it's great to hear. And it's nice to see this polydirectional push towards sustainability and ensuring that it's coming at the forefront from a variety of angles. It looks like it's coming top down, bottom up. Do you find, I guess it's clear when you think about employees and, and the new generation wanting to have roles that are sustainable and impactful, mm -hmm. do you find, what would you say is the, the reason driving these investors and these bankers to ensure sustainability is a priority for their new investments? Yeah, I love that. Uh, because these large companies, think about the biggest companies in the world. I'm, I'm thinking about like General Motors. I'm thinking about Google. Uh, they're making these big commitments publicly. Uh, they're saying we're going to be net zero by 2040 or 2050. And so it doesn't really matter the political landscape. Like those promises are out there and their reputation's at stake. So that that is pushing it. That is the pressure that I'm seeing on these businesses. And it's not changing. Um, so that's the storm that's out there. And I mm. love the storm because it's a very motivating storm. Uh, and then I'm sure we'll get into it. But the good news is that businesses, it's profitable to be good. And um, mm. there's so much proof in that. Uh, when you just look at a, a, a P&L statement, revenue, expenses, like how do you manage uh, making money? money? It's keeping customers, getting new customers, right? And how do you reduce expenses? Well, it could be saving energy consumption, reducing water usage, like it's it's all related to the bottom line. So uh, it's a pretty cool time. No, that's a great quote. It's profitable to be good. It's such a true statement, yet it's very often debated, right? And and Mar, you know, you've been in the space for a very long time. You've had, uh, you've had an extensive experience and you've probably encountered the question, what's the business case? And you probably faced a lot of skeptics concerning that trade-off between profit and sustainability. Can you talk a little bit about how businesses of all sizes can consider that business case and implement sustainable practices, even when resources might be you know, fairly limited. Yeah, absolutely. And hi, everyone. Very happy to be here as well. Um, so to answer your question, I think it really depends on the size of the business. Obviously, the larger scale businesses you know, may have many more resources. Um, third-party consultants that they can engage to help them with their goals. Um, but also small businesses definitely have a place um, as well as an opportunity here. So I would say understanding what the why is would be one of the most important aspects in terms of starting to figure out what sustainable goals as well as practices that you're able to implement. It could be as easy as using the SMART goal system. So having something that's specific, having something that's measurable, achievable, relevant, as well as time bound. And then again, sustainability is such an umbrella term. So there would be specific goals that would make more sense in one industry that may not make sense in another industry. So we could use an example of a goal of reducing waste, let's say. And that could be played out in many different ways. So if it was, perhaps an office, um, a, a company that was working out of an office, maybe their goal to reduce waste would look at developing a waste reduction plan. What does that include? That could include looking at their ongoing consumables. Those would be products that they purchase 
on a reoccurring basis? And what alternatives could they do to reduce the single use waste that comes from those products? They could work with suppliers that have take back programs. So once you've you know, received your goods, the supplier will take back the packaging. They could implement a policy to go digital. So that would be reducing waste that comes from all of the paper that they're printing out to do their work. A lot of the times nowadays, most things are digital. So that would be a really easy one. And then another example would be, let's say it's a cafe or a restaurant. Most people love to go to those establishments in their free time. Of course, we all love to eat and you know, enjoy a coffee every now and then. So some of the goals for um, those types of businesses could be in terms of reducing waste could be how can we reuse our food waste, for example. So there's a lot of innovative restaurants that um, look at taking their compost and instead of just, again, throwing it in the compost and having, you know, their municipal waste supplier deal with that waste, they could actually look to creating cold press juices. They could look to creating sauces and different elements and really just keeping the waste within their company. So to tie that all in, I think it really is important to understand some of the goals that would make the most sense for a business and then develop a plan to actually achieve it. And one of the things that um, is important in any goal is to have it to be quantifiable. So whether that's time based in, you know, every year we would like to reduce our waste by 5% um, or we would like to be better by, you know, another quantifiable marker, having something in place that you can actually look back and compare and understand if you are progressing towards that goal um, or sustainable practice um, is a really good way to ensure that you're successful. Oh, that's great. And I think one of the key takeaways that I'm, I'm taking from what, you're, what you said was sustainability has a role to play in any organization, regardless of the size or scale. And there's abilities for opportun or opportunities for impact, both internally within their internal performance and operations, as well as with your customers and clients. And you can really play around with that to your point. Um, and it seems like from what you said, it's something that comes from the DNA of a corporation or, or your company. It's you have to factor these in, create goals, be actionable, time bound and intentional with what you're going for, uh, with what, with how you're incorporating sustainability. And to that point, can Lindsay, Mark, and both of you or either of you provide any examples of, you know, successful sustainability initiatives that you've seen in the past, work with any clients to, to perform? Uh, sure, I'll jump in. Mar, I'm sure you have a ton too. Yeah, uh, go these ahead. Are always, these are always my favorite ones. And I forgot to mention that, um, and Mar touched on it. Yes, I was mentioning really big companies like General Motors and Google, but think of all the companies that are small and mid-sized that supply to them. And they're the, they're the ones getting that pressure. Uh, definitely my favorite initiative that I've seen work is creating a sustainability committee at a company. It could be the smallest company, could be a big company. Uh, so I've seen this happen with one of my clients. They created the, a team green and they meet every other week and they talk about the initiatives or those promises. Um, Cause it's one thing to say your company's starting to be sustainable, but it's another to actually do the stuff, right? Uh, so maybe you have a quarterly goal to reduce your water consumption by 5%. Well, that green team can actually help your company get a baseline for water consumption, create some cool initiatives, like remind employees to turn off taps or, you know, bring their own water, whatever. And then you can actually, you can actually get it, track it, track the metrics, see how you're producing at the end. So that's a cool one that I've seen. Um, definitely joining the net zero challenge here in Canada is a cool one. I've seen that there's a, a services company that I'm working with right now and they joined Canada's net zero challenge. It's called that if you want to Google it and literally your company can just sign up and then they need your baselines for your greenhouse gas. Uh, emissions and then your company can start setting goals along the way about how you're going to reduce energy consumption or maybe employee commute or maybe business travel there's so many ways you can reduce um and then definitely low-hanging fruit so uh, a, a last company i'll mention uh, they have 100 150 vehicles in their fleet and so while tomorrow they're not going to snap their fingers and have everything electric they're starting as they renew um their lease with with um, like a car provider, they're switching to EVs. So over time, they're creating this initiative and um, everyone's getting behind it. Even employees are switching their personal cars to EVs, which is kind of cool. They have a charging station. So yeah, I, I would say the way to create initiatives that are meaningful are make sure that they 
are traceable or trackable, just like Mar said, and to get people jazzed about it, like get them excited about it. If it was their idea, they're going to participate. Um, and if it's something that's they're drawn to, they're they're definitely going to take part. So, yeah, uh, think it through. But there's some super cool initiatives. If if you want me to bore you later, I'll I'll give you a hundred. <laughs> I'm sure Mar, you've got a bunch too. Any that I missed? Um, yeah, those are some great points. Um, the work that I do is, is largely compliance-based, Rithik, as you had mentioned. So a lot of the times we may have a client who is a developer constructing a new residential project, let's say, and they have decided to pursue a third-party green building certification like LEED. And, you know, at the at the start of the project, they may just be saying, this is the goal that we would like to achieve, this level of certification. We don't necessarily understand what it all means, but we've retained your company to help us out and to consult us. Okay, great. So then while we start to develop a strategy for this project, how can they achieve their goal? Mm -hmm. We are actually able, as Lindsay mentioned, to look at different baselines. So for example, we can look at indoor water use reduction. So we're able to use a calculator tool that takes baseline flow rates for different fixtures. And then we receive the proposed fixtures for the project from maybe it's the owner, maybe it's the mechanical engineer. And we're able to plug in the rates of those proposed fixtures and demonstrate on an annual basis how much water this project is going to save. And it could be within the millions of liters a year. So as we've already kind of touched on, that also is a benefit to the bottom line. This project will be saving hundreds, thousands of dollars on an annual basis in their water costs. In addition to that, something that's really cool is also reusing water. So there's a lot of projects nowadays that will actually capture their rainwater from their roof, let's say, and they'll reuse that water either to irrigate the landscaped areas, um, around their property. They may also reuse that water for toilet flushing. That's something that's not as common nowadays, but I really think in the next five, 10 years, we're gonna be seeing a lot more projects doing that as well. So it's really interesting. It's very cool to see a client at the beginning of a project, not necessarily understand what does this mean to me? What is the benefit for me? And then as we really get into fine tuning their strategy and going through the design and construction of the project, they really get a better understanding of how these sustainable goals will benefit them through the construction as well as in the future operations and occupancy um, for their project as well. And that's great too. I, I find investors nowadays are so cautious about where they're spending their money and where they're allocating their dollars because to your point, a lot of this is at risk, right? A lot of the assets that we're placing are, are that we're purchasing or that we're investing in are at risk due to natural climate change impacts. And it's nice to hear some of the initiatives that are happening at the design and construction stage to know that they're so intentional with how they're building our future homes. Do you find that, or I guess to, another question to ask you, Mar, is how do organizations enhance their resilience to climate change proactively while minimizing that environmental harm? Do you find there's specific strategies that enable better success than others at the planning stage? That's a great question. And it's one that we're discussing a lot more, um, I would say over the last couple of years, resilience as a whole. So I think one of the ways to be most successful in developing a resilience plan or an emergency preparedness plan would be to do an analysis of where your um, business is located. So, you know, a hurricane may be a threat in a certain area of the world, it may not be so much of a threat where you're located. Mm -hmm. So understanding if it's a climate hazard such as wildfires, if it's power outages, if it's a flood or freeze and thaw um, weather events, understanding what item, what uh, events occur on a regular current basis, but also what is more likely to occur in the short term. So that would be five to 10 years, as well as the long term, 10 years plus, and then developing a plan based on what you'll need. So that could include on-site resources. Um, what life-saving supplies would you need? Something as simple as first aid kits, blankets, non-perishable foods. But then it also looks at the actual building systems. Do you have a backup power generator that would be able to withstand a 24-hour power outage or a 72-hour power outage. So 
it really goes back to understanding what are the risks that would you know be most likely to occur based on where you're located and how can you protect you know most importantly the people that would likely be affected as well as your resources your physical resources as, and your capital to withstand those potential damages yeah and that's such an important point right it's it's sustainability isn't just about um in say only environmental benefit it's protecting people, protecting financial interests, protecting assets and ensuring that we are having a future for the generations ahead. And to your point, you know, trying to understand where we're investing and how we're investing is key. A lot of work that I see nowadays in my, in my role at Quinn and Partners um, is we see a lot of scenario analysis planning for different types of housing assets. You know, particularly in the Canadian context, we can see some investors are investing in assets in Alberta, British Columbia, who are very exposed to the wildfires there. So connecting that back, we can see that we, if we understand how often wildfires occur to your point, how to mitigate them, we can create stronger protected homes and help out in this housing crisis that's just not only affordability, but also security as well, right? And when we see that, you know, we see that challenges that are being faced here from a portfolio perspective. But Lindsay, I'm sure you work with many clients from a local perspective as well. And engaging communities and businesses together is something that we find is a common need across the board, whether from whatever sector you're playing in or whatever clients you're working with. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenges that you might face when it comes to engaging community and incorporating their perspectives? Yeah, definitely. And just just to jump in for the, the last question, just really quickly, there's there's so many physical risks, even for small businesses. So I find when we start doing ESG, environmental social governance, we start talking about their supply chain and they start to identify, you know, problem areas like they're so dependent on this one supplier. And if there's another, you know, wildfire this summer that maybe supply is going to be tough for them, they're going to get they're going to get hit hard. So just opening up and looking at all the physical risks of climate change and also the regu regulatory risks that are coming, that's huge. That's big time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm excited about your community question. So it was like, what have you seen in communities that uh, have been successful with regards to sustainability? And I keep pitching Hamilton, but McMaster is a Hamilton. But um, one of the ones I really love is the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. They actually became clean marine certified last year, which is pretty cool because when you think of the marine uh, and down Bayfront here in Hamilton, we don't think of clean marine, but they went above and beyond as a community. I mean, think of all the members that have boats there and they're, they're constantly coming in and out of the harbor there, going under the bridge. And they firsthand see all the problems, right? And so it's pretty cool that they, they got together, they figured out across the 14 main themes of ESG, what matters to them. So the first thing is they started buying more local food. They started requesting to their local provider to stop sending so much plastic. They, they got rid of plastic cups, like red solo cups, and they encouraged everyone to have water bottles. They did a training for all their members. They talked about, you know, putting boats in, bringing boats out. What are you using? How do you get rid of that? And um, so that was a whole smaller community within a community that like got together and then physically and literally they got to raise the flag for clean marine, which is pretty cool. Um, other things I see is uh, something called green drinks. So green drinks is this, uh, literally you go to a pub once a month. Uh, it, there's one in Toronto. I'm sure there's one all over. And um, once a month you meet with like-minded people from all different industries, but you actually get to talk about sustainability, environmentalism, social impact. And um, everyone's from all over. There's accountants, there's lawyers, there, like everyone's from all over the place. And it's a place where we know the common thread is we wanna make a difference and you know create some initiatives and some really cool things have come out of that. So we need a couple of people to be the catalyst in a community itself. Um, there's also, if we look to nature, uh, Conservation Halton, for example, or an organization called 10,000 Trees encourages companies not only to you know, get their baselines and, and organize their company, but also go plant trees. <laughs> I know it's such a funny thing, but uh, in two Sundays from now, I'm going to plant trees for three hours. And uh, wow. I think that I've done, I haven't done that before, but I'm getting ready. And uh, I feel like that physical effort of realizing how much it takes to plant a tree will like encourage people and encourage communities. So uh, not only these little initiatives, but it's just got to be about education and fun and um, yeah, keeping up the hope, right? 
because climate change can feel pretty drab. So if we, uh, we make it fun and doable, then I think that's how you, you in, intertwine sustainability into community. I totally agree. And it's, it's kind of a beautiful sentiment to hear the fact that there's groups all over that might not necessarily be in your own industry, even in your career path. They might just be social groups who are all interested in sustainability and climate change and driving impact, whether that's even homeowners in Hamilton who just take pride in their community and living here. They're driving change. They're on the boots, boots on the ground, working towards getting that done. Mm -hmm. That's a really beautiful sentiment to kind of hear. Mar, do you have any examples in your industry or your work experience that you've seen that have made a significant impact on sustainability? Um, there, there are a lot. Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I think, uh, we can break them up into a couple of different ways. So there's obviously the, the push, um, by clients and investors, um, in the building sector of becoming more sustainable. So this largely affects, um, property managers as well as builders in terms of retaining tenants. So a lot of the larger companies that have, you know, massive offices in downtown areas in various cities around the world, they are requiring that they be in a building that has a third party certification. So that incentivizes property managers to go and get their building certified, um, whether it's an existing building, whether it's a new construction building. Um, there are also various aspects that look at um, the embodied carbon. So a lot of the times when we talk about sustainability um, for many years, we are just looking at the operational carbon. So what is being emitted into the atmosphere based on when we're actually occupying a building. Now we're also having a focus on embodied carbon. So what is the effect of the construction and development of projects? And that actually pay, plays a really um, big role. So what companies are able to do is conduct a life cycle assessment that looks at all of the materialities that they are planning on using for their buildings. Um, you can create a baseline model and it will show you what your carbon emissions intensity is. And then you can also create an optimized model where you're selecting uh, you know, lower embodied carbon concrete selections and steel um, insulation what have you. I don't want to get too technical, but it's really cool that we have all of these new technologies and resources and tools that we can use to really model um, different availabilities. And then clients are able to in turn select what makes the most sense for their goals, what makes the most sense for their wallets, their budgets, and in turn still develop a building um, that is much better performing on the, you know, construction side, as well as on the operational side. Yeah, that's great. And it's, it's, it's to your point, embodied carbon is such a massive issue. That's something that building owners, construction, asset managers, and investors are all tackling around the world. And kind of going back to a little bit of what we mentioned in the beginning of the call, that regulatory push that we're seeing, we're seeing the Toronto Green Standard get more rigorous in their requirements. We're seeing them push that forward, which is great to see. We're seeing, for those on the call, um, many of you might know and might not know, uh, the IFRS, Sustainability Related Financial Disclosures and Climate Disclosures, recently came to Canada. Canada took this draft regulation and mandated it towards Canadian terms and put it out for consultation, which means hopefully within the next year or two, we'll also be seeing a legislative, a legislative regulatory push for sustainability efforts and disclosure and transparency. So we're seeing a lot of this push happen that's enabling corporations and all other, all other uh, business players to talk about the problems that we need to talk about, that we used to never mention, that are material for us to drive this real change. And Mar, you mentioned there's a lot of tools nowadays to help us start understanding our impact and to drive that performance. Do you see a lot of innovative uh, solutions or technology out there now to reduce your carbon footprint while remaining competitive in the market and driving sustainability? There's a lot of buzz on AI and all that going on at the moment. So do you see anything there? Not too much on the AI side um, mm -hmm. from my professional experience, but I'm very interested to learn. And I'm sure that there are many, many ways um, that it can be used for sustainable advantage. Um, one of the cool things kind of, you know, circling back to embodied carbon and materiality um, that we're seeing is um, mass timber being used um, for construction. So most buildings, use concrete and steel um, to construct their building. Now we're seeing um, cross-laminated timber 
which um, does have a little bit of a higher cost, but the hope is that as it becomes more commonplace, the costs um, will be reduced, but it also has a lower embodied carbon footprint um, buildings. Uh, there are some in the Toronto area. Um, so, you know, if you're ever walking down the street and you see a new build that is using um, what looks to appear wood, it is wood and, you know, there's no risk of fire. Um, so we're seeing some cool innovations with materiality um, that is really exciting. And it also adds a nice warmth because I'm sure a lot of you know, if you're located in the Toronto area, sometimes it can be a little bit of a concrete jungle. So it's nice to see, um, you know, more uh, warm uh, materials be used and it also creates a nice sense of place and it brings the outdoors in, which is also another really important aspect of sustainability, you know, being able to feel like we're in nature since we spend so much of our times indoors. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how we moved away from timber when we used to initially have it in a lot of our construction and building, and now we're going all the way back to it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's pretty, pretty ironic to see the change of how it's helpful. Do you find, uh, Mara as well, do you find there's a lot more nature and biodiversity talk coming into the construction and housing sector? Do you see more of that um, being incorporated to drive sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of um, development standards like the Toronto Green Standard um, or third party standards like LEED, there typically are specific sections that are look at sustainable sites and landscaping. So how do we reduce urban heat island effect? How do we create soft landscapes where we're installing, we're not installing, but where we're planting um, trees and different plantings and how do we make sure that they're actually native? So how do we make sure that these are species that are able to flourish with low water demands um, they may be able to just rely on, you know, the natural rainfall, don't need to have too intensive irrigation. We're seeing more green roofs. I personally love seeing green roofs. It adds a nice outdoor amenity to buildings, um, whether it's residential or commercial. And we're also seeing um, urban farming on uh, green roofs as well. Um, they range in terms of the complexity, if it's you know an intensive green roof or if it's more so plant beds um, that are erected on top of the roof. And that ties back to the aspect of allowing people to you know grow local food, allowing people to reduce their costs on groceries, which ties back to the social aspect of sustainability and also fostering a sense of place um, and community as well. So there's some really cool biodiversity landscape uh, trends that are happening as well. Yeah, right. And I find if anyone on the call <laughs> ever has a spare $300 that can go to Vancouver, I'm sure you'll see so many great green roofs in Vancouver and sustainable housing design. It's really incredible to Mars point just to be able to live and walk in the city where nature is all around you, where you don't have to get away from the city to see nature, but it's interconnected like the ecosystem is itself. Um, a lot of innovation that I've been seeing too is um, natural asset inventories. We're getting to the point where we're starting to value nature and see what do these resources that we use that we initially think of as infinite, we now are accepting the fact that they're finite and replacing a value on them and helping and seeing municipalities, indigenous communities and corporations work together to start to understand if we take out this much of a resource, what is the corresponding biodiversity impact that's going to happen on the other side of things. So it's nice to see that biodiversity push happen or be integrated into our work because at the end of the day, it's all related, right? It's all connected to uh, environment and climate change sustainability. Um, Lindsay, are you seeing any similar sorts of cutting edge technology or innovation within um, your work? I know it's, it's spanning various sectors, so there might be more, to, uh, more variety there too. Yeah, I, uh, I I have a funny story. So this morning I got into the cotton factory and th we have a bunch of solar panels on the roof here. And we also, um, we make honey here. There's a bunch of bees up there and a bee got in and uh, it was a pretty fun on Earth Day. We <laughs> kept it safe. I, I mentioned we let them outside. So <laughs> um, I see all different industries doing interesting things with technology. Uh, you mentioned in the at the beginning, Rithik, that I started my career at IBM. And, and so I've kind of always been interested in technology. And so one of the, the things that I wanted to mention is um, there's so many cool tools that your business can use to count your carbon. So you don't have to open up a, an old spreadsheet and start counting everything independently. There's lots of uh, companies that have a platform where they'll just suck your utility bills, get kilowatt hours, get energy, water waste, all that stuff. And then based on where you're located, they'll, they'll tell you your, um, 
your impact, right? Your carbon dioxide uh, impact. So that's been helpful. AI, what I've seen is AI will give suggestions to a business. So, you know, based on our current baselines and the gaps in our ESG strategy and the type of business we are, hey, ChatGPT, give us some ideas about what are some initiatives that would be impactful. And, you know, ChatGPT or who, AI is pretty good at giving us a bunch of ideas. We can also use uh, good old Google and see what uh, folks maybe on the other side of the world are doing. So Europe is, is leading the, the, the world in uh, sustainability, in my opinion. So if I'm working with a client in, let's say, um, chemical, I'll see if there's a similar size company in Europe that's already doing something and I'll, I'll go and take some ideas from there because why wouldn't we lean on that? Um, definitely seeing uh, some technology being used in procurement too, uh, to make sure that a company's supply chain is, um, is sustainable. Uh, so we can lean on technology for that too. Um, and then I'll just, I'll just end my idea about technology with something kind of funny. So when I did my uh, MBA at DeGroote, uh, I did a mini capstone project and uh, it was funny, but it was this company that used seaweed, a very specific type of seaweed. And um, they realized that cows that ate it would produce 70 plus percent less methane. And for those on the call, if you're a nerd like me, we know methane is like one of the most potent greenhouse gases. And so they're starting their business. It's actually called CH4 and they're kind of drying this seaweed up and they're commercializing this and they're selling it to dairy farms. And uh, so it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, technology is all over the place. There's uh, such interesting stories about how we can use technology to fight this huge, uh, this huge problem we're, we're facing. Yeah, that's such a great point, right? It's, it's, we're seeing scientific or I guess technological advancements that's helping us to impact sustainability on so many different fronts. And even the AI, to your point, I, I, I remember coming across a few platforms nowadays that are also incorporating, you know, you take the gross, uh, the square footage of an of a property, you take the area location and you take a few more details about it and it'll tell you the exposed risks, natural risks that it has to the asset. And you'll find a lot more of those being used to plan five, 10 years ahead from now, what type of, how pertinent are these risks to us? How can we plan backwards to make sure that we mitigate from them? So it's nice to see that even in the supply chain, you know, life cycle assessments are being automated too. Practices that typically take months and months to do are getting a little faster because we're using software to understand and relate uh, the entire supply chain process of a final product good um, and figure out what the sustainability material concerns are there. So it's nice to see how tech is coming into that place. But despite this, and you know, despite seeing all these technological advancements in climate change and seeing public consensus grow, we still have a large community uh, or a large knowledge gap between climate change in terms of what's spread and what's accurate and what isn't accurate. Um, to both of you, I wanted to ask, how can we bridge that knowledge gap in terms of climate change facts and, and accuracy versus sometimes the misinformation or the disillusionment that comes across the field that we're in? Uh, I can jump in. I can jump in here. Um, yeah, I, I definitely, I just have a, a quick story. I was, um, I was with a group of people. They were all really smart, nice, professional people. And we were sitting at a table. This is like two years ago. And uh, somebody came to talk to us about climate change, like just in casual conversation. And then slowly, the, you know, without being rude, everyone kind of left <laughs> the table. And it's not, and it's not that they're bad people. It's just that, you know, we, there's not this obvious solution. And it's not impacting our life every minute of the day. And so I think if we talk about the problems that are facing us now, like very relatable things, uh, for example, yeah, the forest fires last summer, they impacted people's lives. You know, people didn't go to work, planes didn't take off, kids' soccer was canceled, like real things happened. Or, um, you know, there was supply shocks um, because of extreme weather and maybe lettuce didn't get to a restaurant. Like that impacts them. That Im Remember the cost of Caesar salad went up. So like these real things that happen, we need to talk about them and then we need to follow them up with a solution and hope rather than throwing down, uh, you know, scary climate change news. We need to be more optimistic, but strategic. Um, that's what I think. That's what I think will keep us, uh, keep it simple, keep us moving. Mar, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think it's, it can be daunting, you know, when we hear some of the, um, what some of the things that 
you know, the scientists are saying may happen if we aren't able to limit the uh, amount that the temperature, the global temperature increases, you know, by 2050, these will be the effects. Those are, it's very scary to hear sometimes. And where is the hope? So I think one thing that really stuck with me was I actually got interested in sustainability while I was doing my undergrad at McMaster. I took an intro to sustainability elective and it really opened my mind. And I remember that the professor said, if we don't do anything and everything that they expect to happen occurs, then, you know, there's no hope for us. There's no hope for the planet. There's no hope for people, animals, everything, right? Things can go very bad. But if we do something and what the worst case scenario doesn't happen, we still are a better operating society. The environment is better. The animals are in a better position. So I think, you know, just deciding whether it's a personal goal, whether it's a goal within your company, whether it's goals that are, you know, mandated on the international level or on the national level, really understanding your place in terms of what you can do. At the end of the day, it's not one person that's going to change the world. Um, but what can we do in our, you know, day to day lives that make us feel personally like we're making a difference? Um, what can we do at our companies if it's not, you know, a sustainable company? What ideas can we introduce, bring to the table and see if these are things that can be implemented? And then also, how do we spend our money? Um, you know, where can we spend our money to make sustainable choices, whether that means shopping local or looking at your investments, um, looking at your mutual funds, you can select um, funds that have, you know, more sustainable building, uh, not building stories, clearly this is the work I do, but more sustainable um, companies that are involved. So really just choosing what your main why is and then developing actions that support that um, and make it easier to, you know, sleep at night, to be honest, because yeah, sometimes it can be um, scary, but just doing little things at a time really do end up making a big difference um, if we're, we're all in it together. Now that's great. And I think um, it really resonates with me because I, I'm a graduate of the Integrated Business and Humanities program at McMaster. And a lot of our curriculum over the last five years was spent talking about the interconnectedness of our choices and our decisions and how climate, social, you know, the environmental, social governance, business, society, it's all connected. And one impact in the climate space, to your point, Mara and Lindsay, has an impact on the social space. And recognizing that, communicating that, and making that more evident to see is a great way to start embedding responsible decision making, informed decision making in all of our choices in the future. And I find that at least the IBH program really prepared me for that when it came to understanding the climate space, understanding the severity of what's going on, as well as just informing me and giving me a really strong reason on why to care. Um, I want to save time to get into some of the questions that our audience has provided us, but I did want to ask one more question to you both. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, the precursor to sustainability, what it's looked like in the past, what the present day looks like, and a little bit about scenario analysis, the point of thinking what uh, sustainability might look like in the future, but we haven't really expanded on that topic yet. So I wanted to go broader and just see what is your vision for the future of sustainability? What does that green paving look like to you? I'll go first then. Uh, okay, so uh, I th I think it's bright. I think the future is bright. I actually think that most jobs will have will touch on sustainability in the future. Um, I know it it seems a bit daunting right now, but I do think regulation will come to Canada, and if businesses aren't mandated to start reporting on their you know their usage of materials, raw materials, and their impact and their greenhouse gas emissions, they're going to want to because these bigger companies are going to be asking them for this stuff. So I do think it's it's coming. I don't know that it'll be called sustainability. We might come and change the term again for it. But um, I, I think the future is bright. I think we're going to definitely be leaning on technology. Uh, I love that there's this big wave of uh, younger people that, that care and uh, want to make a difference. I think they're going to drive us. And um, yeah, I definitely think the, the future is friendly. Uh, and I'm seeing some cool initiatives. Actually, one today, I, I logged into LinkedIn this morning, and I saw a really cool one, which is instead of a, a local community 
garden party, they did a retrofit party in their neighborhood and everybody in the neighborhood could go visit the houses that had solar panels or a heat pump. Like, how cool is that? Um, so it's going to become a, a trend that's not, um, that's not nerdy, but that's like cool. And um, yeah, people are going to want to live their lives in this way. And people are going to want to have businesses that, that care about sustainability and make it a priority. It's, it's going to happen. That's what I think. Yeah, I love more? that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I hope the future of sustainability looks like, I agree with everything that Lindsay said, um, would be the idea of a circular economy. So the model of using resources, production, where we don't just go from, you know, a product or material being created, extracted from, you know, the ground, developed, sold, used, and then thrown away, but where we're really focusing on the reuse of the three R's. So how do we continue to recycle elements? How do we repurpose things and use them in another way? How do we keep things big and small out of our landfills for as long as possible. Um, hopefully there's obviously a big shift from single use plastic. Um, hopefully there are more bulk grocery stores in communities where consumers are able to bring, you know, their own reusable containers and get their rice and get their pastas and get their shampoos and conditioners rather than continuing to buy um, packaging that you're just gonna throw out. Um, and hopefully a lot more um, sustainable urban gardening, whether that's you know having a small garden on the balcony of your apartment or a garden in your backyard or having these community gardens um, that are shared within neighborhoods and you know people are able to plant their own fruits and vegetables and really you know create a relationship um, I don't do really much gardening myself, but I love seeing other people um, gardening. And I love, you know, when you eat something that's local and you can really taste the difference. So just aspects of, of keeping things circular, um, keeping things, you know, within your community. I would really love to see that um, in the future versus, you know, everything being so global. Um, yeah. No, I love that. I love what both of you said. I, I totally agree. The future is right the future is green it's reusable it's circular and i think it's also um i think it's very the future is indigenous the future is transformative and i think the future is very local i i find that thinking about sustainability ahead i see brightness and green but i also think that with it i don't i, I think we have the solutions that we've been looking for we have everything we need to enable that change and i think we'll get there uh, just by prioritizing the right types of investments and initiatives and embedding sustainability within our decision making. And we're seeing that happen um, with the new standards and regulations coming out, pushing businesses from an investor level, from a customer level, from a polydirectional level to have that change. What both of you are saying, I definitely see the future as sustainable as well. And I think it's it's circular, if anything, but um, it's polydirectional with the push. And I'm excited to see what comes. Um, Thank you both for that. Um, I want to move into some of the questions that we have from our audience. I'll start with one and maybe we can answer with one, uh, maybe one panelist per question or how we split it up. But first one we have is, should students consider a career in sustainability, considering a career in sustainability, pursue roles within sustainability teams or departments, or would filling a more traditional role with a sustainability minded person be more effective at driving organizational change? I can take that. I, I'm not sure if there's necessarily a right answer. I think one is likely a, an easier pathway forward than the other. Um, finding work within a company that you know is already sustainable, um, provides services or products with a sustainable lens. Obviously, you're already immersing yourself into a company that believes in the idea of sustainability, believes in its importance. Um, so that's a kind of a, a clear way to, you know, start your career, um, to start getting experiences to stay in sustainability. On the other hand, there is, of course, opportunities to create change in more traditional, let's call it, companies that don't really have a sustainable focus. Those, you know, may take longer to do. Um, they may they may or may not be successful, but I think at the end of the day, if you were to take that approach, if you were able to develop a business model and really show companies what they would be able to do in terms of, you know, 
the three pillars of sustainability, let's call it, um, there may be opportunity and um, room for success. And, and I really hope that there would be because there are so many ways to, to get creative um, and to progress uh, business models, whether it is a sustainable company um, or not. Yeah, totally agree. I feel like there's a lot of ways for us to be change agents within an organization. And especially with the new generation of hires that are coming out, you have that influence, um, even just by starting to ask questions about sustainability from the get go, um, can drive that impact. Uh, moving on to a question from uh, another audience member. What about sustainability for non for profit organizations or other organizations that don't have investors and are funded by the provincial government? How should they drive ESG when profits aren't necessarily their focus? I love this question because my newest client is exactly in this bucket. Um, so uh, I, typically uh, companies come to me because they have to pass something like EcoVadis or they need to do an ISO certification or, you know, they, they need to do it because they, they are a for-profit company. But I do get to work with nonprofits and I love it. And so why would you do this if it's not about profits? Well, it's definitely about reputation. It's about doing the right thing. And without it, oftentimes your board might be asking about it. Um, and so typically what I do is I think board training is one of the first things that we do. We talk about what, what does this look like for a nonprofit like you? Um, what is E, S, and G? And then I mentioned this before, but I always look to other parts of the world. Is there a non for profit like you and a company over in Europe, for example, and what are they doing? And then we bring those ideas here. And then we start to talk about, should we do some reporting? Which reporting framework should we use? There's a bunch and I won't mention them all, but uh, you might've heard of SASB or the task force on climate related financial disclosures or the GRI, there's a million. So, you know, which one makes sense for you to voluntarily report with? Um, and then how can you get some of your stakeholders involved? So maybe it's, you know, it's, um, it's, it's folks in the community. Maybe it's people supplying to the community. It could be your board. It could be your own employees. So you gotta pull it all together. Um, the good news is that when I work for nonprofit profits, they're, they're usually very special in that they've already begun a journey down a lot of these paths. So when I think about ESG, I think about 14 themes and energy, water, waste, greenhouse gas emissions. I won't list them all, but then we get into the S, diversity and inclusion, labor, um, wages, health and safety. A lot of these topics they've probably already covered or are covering very succinctly. So. Uh, we take a holistic approach on ESG, and then we present maybe to the board or to you as to why we should make a couple changes, tackle some low-hanging fruit to really strengthen your strategy going forward. So I hope that answers your question, but yes, it's definitely relevant for not-for-profits, if not more relevant, um, and it doesn't always have to be about profits. Thank you, Lindsay. And I think we'll have time for one more question. Um, we've answered a few of the other ones through our conversation, which is nice, but... I'll ask the last one. Supply chain and investors are clearly driving much of the work in sustainability, but our political parties seem to be well behind. Do we need their, their leadership or can we do this without them? How should we approach political activism? I love this question. Um, I think I, I mentioned this earlier, but as politicians come in and out and our government changes over both like federally, provincially, and if, even if we look to our neighbors to the South, what really is driving this is actually not po politics. It's these big companies. They're driving it, in my opinion, what I've seen. And so if they're not, they're not changing their pathway, they, they've announced net zero by 2040, for example, it doesn't really matter what's going on in politics. We, the supply chains have to start reporting. They have to start being clean or else, hey, guess what, Ontario business, you're not going to be able to, to supply to Volkswagen anymore starting next year, for example. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge giant optimist and I, I do believe that our, our political folks here in Canada can make a difference, they can make some good choices, but we're not leaving, leaving it all up to them. So yeah, businesses need, need to make changes and it's, and it's profitable to do so, makes business sense to do so. So hey, we can carry the torch um, definitely from here. 
Yeah, great point. And it's so many stakeholders with all varying levels of influence who can drive that change. So it's nice to see that we can all impact it. Even, you know, to stay competitive, Canada has to keep pushing on that front. And we're seeing some more investments too in critical minerals and mining and across the board on driving that change. So it's nice to see. Um, I'll take these last couple of minutes just to allow all of us to kind of introduce any, uh, a little bit of what we're working on at the moment, any opportunities for the audience to further their own sustainability impact. Um, I can quickly start and then I'll pass it over to Mar or to Lindsay and Mar. Um, for those of you in the beginning, uh, for those of you in the call, in the beginning, I realized I forgot to introduce myself because I was so excited to hear what Mar and Lindsay had to say. So for um, just for everyone in the call context, my name is Rithik and I am an alumni from the Integrated Business and Humanities Program at McMaster. I've had about two to three years of work, uh, professional experience in the sustainability space. I'm now working at Quinn and Partners, which is a Canadian climate change sustainability consulting. Our firm has had about over 10 years of experience um, in this space, driving, supporting asset investors, corporations, um, pension funds, financial institutions that drive towards the low carbon economy. Will be for any of you who are graduating uh, undergrad or finishing their MBAs or their masters. We'll be hiring a new set of analysts in September uh, 2024 for the 2025 year. Start dates in January, July. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity there. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn to discuss or anything like that. Um, on the personal side, I do a lot of work with um, I do a little work with elementary schools and doing sustainability workshops with them on my own personal time to help them, you know, inspire nature and sustainability from a young lens. So if anyone's ever interested in getting involved in teaching grade one to three to four or five students on how to become sustainable, think about environment, care about the environment, I'd love to always help out on that front. And in general, I've had a plethora of experience with a variety of volunteering and extracurricular sustainability space. So please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'll pass it over to Lindsay. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um... I, my company is This Rock, and I, and I developed it inside McMaster, which is kind of fun. So I, I did an entrepreneurship class, and um, I wanted to come up with a firm that helps small, small and mid-sized businesses get more sustainable. And um, I said, well, some plan to retire on Mars. We're betting on This Rock. And um, so that's why I've got a little This Rock guy. Um, but um, if anybody is curious about pivoting, I pivoted in my career. I used to work in tech, and now I'm over here. And just with a couple of credentials and rolling up my sleeves and, um, and really listening a lot, I was able to pivot my career over there. So if your business needs help or if you just want to talk to me about uh, moving over to sustainability, I'm so happy to help. And um, thanks, Marl. I'll, I'll toss it to you. Thank you. Had an issue with my unmute button for a second there. Um, I think one of the things that we have, you know, touched on several times is that sustainability isn't going away. So in the, you know, almost five years that I've been in the industry, I've seen it expand in so many different ways. When I first realized that I wanted to work in sustainability, I had, you know, really no idea what that would look like. Um, when I joined the company that I currently work at, Pratis Group, we were, you know, a team of four and now Five years later, we're a team of over 30, um, along with our sister company, Quasar Consulting Group. They also are continuing to grow. So it's really exciting for people who are looking to enter the field of sustainability. There are so many um, opportunities that are available. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, Green Drinks is a great organization um, that you can look into for you know, networking in person. Um, there's also so many resources that you can find online. So if you have a specific interest in sustainability, um, whether it be buildings, whether it be finance, whether it be farming, you can really find, you know, even just using YouTube, you can find um, channels that really speak to that. You can learn um, through those channels. You can learn through, you know, small postgraduate programs. And then you can also learn by just getting um, a job opportunity. So you don't necessarily, you know, need to go back to school. Um, that can be quite limiting in, you know, a number of ways. Um, so definitely, I hope everyone on this call that's looking to enter the field or is already in the field, um, please know that you're you're more than able to to learn um, with real life experience. And there's so many opportunities. So thank you very much for having me as well. Thank you both. Um, one last thing I'll mention for any current students at McMaster, there's so many electives in sustainability at McMaster. We're really driving on that front. Even the Degree School of Business. Um, at a broader perspective, has courses on sustainable finance and are drive are creating more opportunities for students to learn and get engaged. Um, the IBH program itself is 
doing a great job at integrating climate change into their courses. So always be on lookout for those. To Mar and Lindsay's points, there are opportunities that are there for those who seek them. So do your best to find them. Reach out if you ever want to talk about the space. But overall, thank you for attending. And we really, really hope that you gain some valuable knowledge here today and can help push on the sustainability front. So thank you.